Thanks for coming, those of you who are here. So today we wanted to share with you an interesting experience we had working with Earthwatch in studying climate change at Acadia National Park. And you know, to John and I personally, it was you know really interesting and enjoyable experience because we got to go to a place where we love the most, which is national parks. At the same time, we got to apply some of our data science and you know data engineering background to help study climate change at Acadia National Park. And that's what the next 10 minutes are going to be about. Right. So regardless of the cause, we know that climate change is happening, right? The evidence is in and, and uh, you know, it's clear that it's happening. And we can see it in the ice caps as documented by James Baylog in the really fantastic Chasing Ice documentary. We also see it in the oceans. As the oceans are warming, the coral reefs are starting to die. And what's, what's not always immediately apparent is that weather is nature's clock, right? A lot of things in nature happen based on the temperature and seasonal changes and stuff like that. So uh, it really drives a lot of things that happen in nature. So this clock that John talks about is evident in the spring and the fall frost that we observe. So if you look at the, the situation today from something which existed 100 years ago, you know, the spring frost back 100 years ago used to occur much you know, later and the fall frost would occur much earlier. But now the two have you know, reversed and it's diverging so much that the, the fall frost is appearing much late and the spring frost is appearing much earlier. And you know, these are all clear indications of climate change. Likewise, if you observe the interaction of species, for example, you know, caterpillar or white moth, for, for instance, occurs at a certain point in time every year and it has never faltered in the last 100 years. But what's happening in the last two decades or so is the caterpillar species are appearing much earlier. But a certain bird species, which is dependent on the caterpillar, are still following the same rhythm. So by the time the bird lays an egg and you know, the hatchlings are ready, the caterpillar population has already gone. So as a result, there has been a decline in the population of several bird species because they haven't been able to adapt to climate as quickly as the caterpillar species has been adapting to. And this is what is called as phenology, These, you know, the, the effect or the influence of climate on plant and animal species. And studying this is you know, the job or you know, what most of the researchers at Acadia National Park do day in and day out. And when we went there, we basically first studied it ourselves through their eyes. You know, we learned about all the challenges the park is facing because of climate change. And we wanted to see how data science and you know, big data could help study these climate change in a much better fashion and also perhaps build something which could help influence in reversing this to a certain extent. So here's an example of a point in Acadia National Park. It's one of the easternmost sections of the United States. It's called the Scudic Point and you can see John there looking at the waves. So here is where a lot of the ornithologists or bird, bird watchers observe migrations of birds you know, across the Atlantic. And what they literally do is they go stand there and they count the number of birds of different species passing across this point and they make note of it at what point, you know, what day of the year was the bird observed. Now, this has shown some interesting, you know, changes because of climate change. So the birds are appearing early, for example, because of climate change in the last decade or so. Right. So phenology is a big problem, right? It, it requires a lot of... Uh, going out in nature, taking samples, observations. And so like any other big problem, we scale out. And, and the Hadoop analog for phenology is something called citizen science. And this is where volunteers go out in the field. They observe nature. They observe bird migrations, uh, plants, either greening up or browning down. They collect that data and they submit it to a variety of organizations that are taking this information in and curating it and making it available for scientific research. So citizen science is, is really at the core of this because it's the only way we're going to scale up measuring and really getting a handle on this, this impact of climate on phenology. And so, you know, there's, there's a few things that are impeding the scientific progress in this area, right? One of them is that these citizen science organizations are, are in a way uh, siloed in that they have their data sets, they're collecting them, but they're not easily shareable or accessible, right? Um, and this isn't because those organizations don't want to share the data, it's just logistically it's, it's, it's hard to do. Also, when, the, when scientists do get the, 
the data, they often have to condition it themselves. And so there's variety of approaches in how to do things like smoothing and stuff like that. And of course, there's different analysis platforms and scripts. And so what ends up happening is this inconsistent treatment of the data often becomes one of the debating points instead of the science, instead of the findings. So what it is essentially missing is that you know citizen scientists are psyched about collecting data to help in the climate change cause, but what they don't get in return is a feedback loop of sorts. So you know they don't know what happens to the data that they've collected. They don't know who have benefited from the data they've collected, and they can't see for themselves how the data they've collected has helped you know in our understanding of climate change. So this is where you know EMC and the Pivotal and the rest of the EMC Federation of Companies have come together to help you know, scientists at Acadia National Park in working with, you know, a couple of different organizations as listed here. So we worked with Earthwatch Institute, which is an organization which helps corporates, you know, study climate change through these expedition events. You know, it's like a one week long event where you go and, you know, uh, work with uh, scientists at the national park to study the effect of climate change over there. We also work with a nonprofit called Scudic Institute, which is based in Acadia National Park, and they also have a team of scientists who work with us, you know, the five days that we were there collecting data and understanding the challenges that citizen scientists uh, face day in and day out. Yeah. So our objectives in all this are, are many fold, right? First, there's a lot of value in, in creating a curated authoritative data repository so that scientists have a referenceable data set that they can put in their papers to say, my research, my models are based on this data set. And so now we can shift some of the debate over how data was conditioned and curated to, okay, what did the data tell you? What did your modeling tell you? And to the degree possible, we want to create a, a shared analysis platform based on our technologies to enable these scientists to do the kind of research that they need to do with the tools and the, and the resources that they might not be able to get with their own budgets. And finally, we want to create a variety of web portals so that we can start to tie in with the citizen scientists so that they can see that how the data they contribute ends up enabling scientific research. So they can see that feedback loop of when I go out and you know, observe birds and submit data, I'm actually contributing to some scientific research. We also want to give some visualization exploration tools for education, provide access to data sets for those uh, uh, aspiring data scientists to do things at home, and also uh, start to work with some of these partners to figure out if there's ways that we can do common data collection APIs and interfaces so that um, we can start to make it easier for this data to be collected. So, what we're doing is we're, we're, we're getting data from a variety of, of collaborators, eBird, HotCount, Nature's Notebook, and the NCDC uh, for climate data. And we're putting those things into our Data Lake Foundation based on our Isilon and ECS platforms. And then from there, we're using some of our pivotal technologies to do the analytics. Sure, so like John mentioned, so what we're trying to do is you know, close this feedback loop for citizen scientists. So we're taking all these data sets we are currently putting it into a data lake, and we're using open source tools for machine learning on big data, both our own. Like two days ago, we announced that we are open sourcing a big data suite, which includes Hawk and Greenplum. These are you know, enterprise data warehouses which can now work with Hadoop and are completely open source, as well as machine learning libraries like MLlib, which is on the Spark platform. So we are adopting the best and the, you know, the, 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 the most efficient libraries to study uh, climate change. So if you think of it, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build models for predicting when a certain species of bird is going to appear at a certain region depending on the climate variables. Now for citizen scientists this is really useful is because they can understand the effect of different input variables on a certain target. So that will kind of complete the feedback loop where they'll know that okay, if the temperature goes up by two degrees Celsius, that means a certain hawk species is going to appear like a month late and that in turn is going to have an adverse effect on you know the, the the predator population or the prey population so on and so forth so that feedback loop is what we are trying to focus on and the way we want to show off these results is through a portal where citizen scientists can go and play around with you know changing different input variables to see the effect on the output variables and thereby understand how you know in you know how important climate change is and how important it is for us to act now to reverse this process so here's a quick summary of you know, different snapshots of our 
our week at Acadia, and we'll put the slides out, and basically what we want to say is, you know, it's not only interesting, but by being there and experiencing it, we understand the challenges involved much better, and thereby, you know, we see more value in the time that we are spending in building up this big data lake solution to study climate change. Right, so since that one week expedition, we've started to collect the data, create the initial data lake platform, we are actively doing collaboration across all the organizations with the research scientists that we listed on the slide, and we're targeting to have an initial web presence sometime in March. And then from there, we're planning how to build that full vision using a, the EMC Federation technologies. We're also talking with other corporate sponsors, and we're exploring ways to support other academic and climate projects with this platform. We're hoping to scale it up to, to, to go beyond this particular engagement. And so, in the in some sense, this is the end, but it's also the beginning, right? We're really excited about this work. We, we plan to take it uh, to its conclusion. And if you'd like to learn more, we have a video that was posted to YouTube today that gives us a nice, gives you a nice overview of, of the week that we spent there and what we're trying to do. And there's a variety of blogs here uh, that you can go and you can um, read a bit more about it. And, and you know, certainly tweet the team, right? Contact any of us if you have more questions or would like to know more. So thank you very much. Thank you so much.